If the pandemic taught us anything, it's that if you're not a digital business, you're out of business. But in so many respects, the digital mandate that was thrust upon us was really reactive and often not as well thought out as many clients and customers would have liked. Sure, there were lots of digital initiatives underway prior to the pandemic, but there was a general sense at the time of complacency pre-COVID for a lot of companies. You know, there was a sentiment of, ah, yeah, we'll get to that, put it on the back burner, or we got plenty of time to figure that out, or even worse, I'll be retired before tr digital transformation really becomes a thing. Someone else will have to deal with that. That all changed in March of 2020. The reality is more plain than ever. We need to move faster to build new capabilities and the cost and risk of modernizing legacy systems keeps going up and up. Hello, my name is Dave Vellante and thank you for tuning in to the Application Modernization Summit made possible by Couchbase. In a moment, a terrific panel of leading industry analysts will join me to discuss what they think enterprises need to know about application modernization. We'll also tap into fresh survey data to get interviews with more than 600 CIOs, CTOs, and technology practitioners from all over the world, what they're saying about application modernization and digital transformation. After the panel discussion, we'll talk to Ravi Mayaram, who's the chief technical officer at Couchbase to get his take on the specific and tangible steps we're going to push them that you can take to modernize your application portfolio. And then finally, we'll get the customer viewpoint on this topic with Amdocs, a leading software and services provider to telcos, media, and financial services firms. Amdocs is a decades old company that has had to modernize its application portfolio for the digital age. And we'll speak to their head of technical product management to find out what they've done to modernize and where they are in their journey. So keep it right there as we dig in. Where do modern apps go from here? We're going to answer that. What does modernization look like in the 2020s? And what insights can help reduce the friction to your cloud application modernization projects? You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech. Welcome to this CUBE Power Panel, where we're going to talk about application modernization, also success templates, and take a look at some new survey data to see how CIOs are thinking about digital transformation as we get deeper into the post-isolation economy. And with me are three familiar VIP guests to CUBE audiences. Tony Baer is the principal at DB Insight. Doug Henshin, VP and principal analyst at Constellation Research, and Sanjeev Mohan, principal at Sanjmo. Guys, good to see you again. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. All right, Doug, let's get started with you. You know, this recent survey, which was commissioned by Couchbase, 650 CIOs and CTOs and IT practitioners. So obviously very IT heavy. Uh, they responded to the following question. In response to the pandemic, my organization accelerated our application modernization strategy. And of course, an overwhelming majority, 94%, Agreed, strong, agreed or strongly agreed. So I'm sure Doug, that you're not shocked by that, but in the same survey, <coughs> modernizing existing technologies was second only behind cybersecurity as the top investment priority this year. Doug, bring us into your world and tell us the trends that you're seeing with the clients and customers you work with in their modernization initiatives. Well, the survey is, uh, of course, is spot on. Uh, you know, any constellation research analyst, any systems integrator, will tell you that we saw more transformation uh, work in the last two years than in the prior six to eight years. A lot of it was forced. You know, a lot of movement to the cloud, a lot of uh, process improvement, a lot of automation work. Uh, but transformational is aspirational, and not every company can be a leader. Um, you know, at, at constellation, we we focus our research on those market leaders and that's only you know the top 5% of companies that are really innovating, that are really disrupting their markets. Um, and we try to share that with companies that want to be fast followers. That these are the next 20 to 25% of companies 
that don't want to get left behind, uh, but don't want to hit some of the some of the same roadblocks and you know pioneering uh, pitfalls that uh, the real leaders are encountering when they're harnessing new technologies. So the rest of the companies, you know, the cautious adopters, the laggards, many of them fall by the wayside. That's certainly what we saw during the pandemic. Um, who are these leaders? You know, the old saw examples that people cite, the Amazons, the Teslas, the Airbnbs, the Ubers and Lyfts. Uh, but new examples are emerging every year. Uh, and as a consumer, you, you immediately recognize these transformed experiences. One of my favorite examples from the pandemic is Rocket Mortgage. Um, I, no disclaimer required, I don't own stock and they're not a client. <laughs> Um, but when I wanted to take advantage of those record low mortgage interest rates, I called my current bank and some, you know, stalwart, very established conventional banks. I'm talking to you, Bank of America, Citibank, and they, they were taking days and weeks to get back to me. Rocket Mortgage had a locked in commitment that day, a very proactive, consistent communications across web, mobile, email, all, all customer touch points. I closed in a matter of weeks, an entirely digital, seamless process. The, you know, this is back in the gloves and mask days and uh, the loan officer came, parked in our driveway, handed, wiped down an iPad, handed us, handed us that iPad. We signed all those documents digitally, completely electronic workflow. The only wet signatures required were those demanded by the state. Uh, so it's easy to spot these transformed experiences. Um, <laughs> You know, Rocket had most of that in place before the pandemic, and that's why they captured 8% of the national mortgage market by, by 2020, and they're on track to hit 10% uh, here in 2022. Yeah, those are great examples. I mean, I'm not a shareholder either, but I am a customer. I went through the same thing in the pandemic. It was all done in digital. It was a piece of cake. And I happened to have to do another one with a different firm and stuck with that firm for a variety of reasons, and it was night and day. So to your point, it was a forced march to digital. If you were there beforehand, you had real advantage and could accelerate your lead during the <coughs> pandemic. Okay, uh, now Tony Bear, Mr. Bear, I understand you're skeptical about all this buzz around digital transformation. So in that same survey, the data shows that the majority of respondents said that their digital initiatives were largely reactive to outside forces, the pandemic, compliance changes, et cetera. But at the same time, they indicated that the results while somewhat mixed, were generally positive. So why are you skeptical? The reason being, uh, and by the way, I have nothing against application modernization. The problem, I think the, the problem I have is that it often gets conflated with digital transformation and digital transformation itself has become such a buzzword and so overused that it's really hard, if not impossible, to pin down <clears throat> what digital transformation actually means. And very often what you'll hear from, let's say a sea level um, you know, you know, a person is well. We want to run like Google, regardless of whether or not that goal is realistic. Um, you know, you know, for that organization. Um, <clears throat> the thing is that we've been using, uh, you know, businesses have been using uh, digital data since the days of the mainframe. Since the, you know, you know, sorry, that data has been digital. What really has changed, though, um, is just the degree of how we inter of how businesses interact with their customers, their partners, with the whole rest of the ecosystem, and how their business and how in many cases you can take a look at the auto industry that the nature of the business you know is changing. So there is real change afoot. The question is, I think we need to get more specific in our goals. And when you look at it, if we can boil it down to a couple, maybe like you know boil it down like fairly oversimplistically. It's really all about connectedness. Now, not, I'm not saying connectivity because that's more of a physical thing, but connectedness, being connected to your customer, being connected to your supplier, being connected to the, you know, you know, to the whole landscape you know, um, that, you know, you know, that, that you operate in. And of course, today we have many more channels with which we, you know, we, uh, you know, we, you know, we operate, you know, with, you know, with customers. And in fact, also, if you take a look at what's happening in the automotive industry, for instance, so I was just reading an interview with Bill Ford. This is, you know, their Ford is now rapidly, you know, ramping up, you know, their electric, you know, their electric vehicle strategy. And what they realize is it's not just a change of technology, you know, it's a change in their business. It's a change in terms of the relationship they have with their customer. Their customers have traditionally been automotive dealers, who and the automotive dealers have, you know, traditionally and in many cases by, you know, by state law 
now have been the ones who own the relationship with the end customer. But when, uh, but when you go to an electric vehicle, um, the product becomes a lot more of a software product. And in turn, that means that Ford would have much more direct interaction you know, with, its, you know, with its end customers. So that's really what it's all about. It's about you know, connectedness. It's also about the ability to act. You know, we'll say agility is about the you know, ability, you know, not just to react, but to anticipate and act. And so, and and of course, with all you know, with all the you know the um, the proliferation, you know, the explosion of data sources, um, you know, and connectivity out there, and the cloud, which allows much more you know access to compute, it changes the whole nature of the ball game. The fact is, is that we have to avoid being overwhelmed by this and make our, you know, make our goals more, I guess, tangible, more, more strictly defined. Yeah. Now, so, you know, great, great points there. And, and, and I want to just bring in some survey data again, two thirds of the respondents said their digital strategies were set by IT and only 26% by the C-suite, 8% by the line of business. Now this was largely a survey of CIOs and CTOs, but wow, <laughs> doesn't seem like the right mix. And to Doug's, point about, you know, leaders and, and laggers. My guess is that Rocket Mortgage, that their digital strategy was led by the chief digital officer potentially. But, but at the same time, you would think, Tony, that application modernization is a prerequisite for, for digital transformation. But I want to go to Sanjeev, in this, uh, more in the survey, and respondents said that on average, they want 58% of their IT spend to be in the public cloud three years down the road. Now, again, this is CIOs and CTOs, but, but this is IaaS, PaaS and SaaS. But that's a big number and there was no ambiguity because the question wasn't worded as cloud, it was worded as public cloud. So Sanjeev, what do you make of that? What's your feeling on, on cloud as you know, flexible architecture? What does this all mean to you? Dave, 58% of IT spend in the cloud is a huge change from today. Today, most estimates peg cloud IT spend to be somewhere around five to 15%. So what this number tells us is that the cloud journey is still in its early days. So we should buckle up, we ain't seen nothing yet. But let me, let me add some color to this. CIOs and CTOs may be ramping up their cloud deployments, but they still have a lot of problems to solve. I can tell you from my uh, previous experience, when, for example, when I was in Gartner, I used to talk to a lot of customers who were in a rush to move into the cloud. So if we were to plot, let's say a maturity model, typically a maturity model in any discipline in IT would have something like crawl, walk, run. So what, what I was noticing was that these, these organizations were jumping straight to run because in the pandemic, they were under the gun to quickly deploy into the cloud. So now they're kind of coming back down to, you know, to crawl, walk, run. So basically they did what they had to do under the circumstances, but now they are starting to, to resolve some of the very, very important issues. For example, security, data privacy, governance, observability. These are all uh, very big ticket items. Another huge problem that now we are noticing more than we've ever seen are the rising costs. Cloud makes it so easy to onboard new cases, new use cases, but it leads to all kinds of, of uh, unexpected increasing spikes in your operating expenses. So what we are seeing is that organizations are now getting smarter about where the workloads should be deployed. And sometimes it may be in more than one cloud. Multi-cloud is no longer an aspirational thing. So that is a huge trend that we are seeing. And that's why you see there's so much increased planning to spend money in public cloud. We do have some issues that we still need to resolve. For example, multi-cloud sounds great, but we still need some sort of single pane of glass, control plane, so we can have some fungibility and move workloads <laughs> around. And some of this may also not be in public cloud. Some, some workloads may actually be done in a more hybrid environment. Yeah, definitely. I, I call it super cloud. People win sometimes super. at that term, but it's, it's above multi-cloud, it floats uh, you know, on top of it. But so you clearly identified some potholes, so, but I want to talk about the evolution of the application experience because there's some potholes there too. 81% of the respondents in that survey 
said, quote, our development teams are embracing the cloud and other technologies faster than the rest of the organization can adopt and manage them. And that was an interesting finding to me because you'd think that infrastructure as code and designing in security and containers and Kubernetes would be a great thing for organizations. Mm -hmm. And it is, I'm sure, in terms of developer productivity, but what do you make of this? Does the modernization path also have some potholes, Sanjeev? Mm -hmm. What are those? So uh, first of all, uh, Dave, you mentioned in your previous question, there's no ambiguity, it's at public cloud. This one, I feel it has a, quite a bit of ambiguity because it talks about cloud and other technologies. That sort of opens up the kimono. It's like, that's everything. Also, it says that the rest of the organization uh, is, have, is not able to adopt and manage. Adoption is a business function. Management is an IT function. So I feel this question is, is a bit loaded. Now, we know that app modernization is here to stay. Developing in the cloud removes a lot of traditional barriers of procuring, instantiating infrastructure. In addition, developers today have so many more advanced tools. So they're able to develop the application faster because they have like low code, no code options. They have notebooks to write the machine learning code. They have the entire DevOps CI CD tool chain that makes it easy to version control and push changes. But there are potholes. For example, are developers really interested in fixing data quality problems? All data privacy, data access, data governance, uh, how about monitoring? Uh, I doubt developers want to get encumbered with all of these operationalization management uh, pieces. Developers are very keen to deliver new functionality. So what's, what we are now seeing is that it is left to the data team to figure out all of these operationalization, product, productionalization the things that, that, that the developers have, um, you know, are not truly interested in that. So, which actually takes me to this uh, topic that uh, Dave, uh, you've been quite actively covering and uh, we've been talking about, which is the whole data mesh. Yeah, I was going to say, it's going to solve all those data quality problems, Sanjeev. <laughs> you know I'm a sucker for data mesh, but. <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but, see, but, but see what's going to happen with data mesh is that developers are now going to have more domain resident power to develop these applications. What happens to all of the data curation, governance, quality that you know a central team used to do? So there's a lot of uh, open-ended questions that still need to be answered. Yeah, that gets automated, Tony, right? With computational <laughs> governance. So anyway, oh, not, of course. It's yeah. not trivial. It's not trivial, but I'm I'm still an optimist by the end of the decade. We'll start to get there. Doug, I want to go to you again and talk about the business case. We we all remember you know, the, the, the business case for modernization that is, remember the Y2K, there was a big IT spending binge and this was before the sassification of the enterprise, right? CIOs, they'd be asked to develop new applications and the business maybe helps pay for it or offset the cost for the initial work and deployment. Then IT got stuck managing the sprawling portfolio for years. And a lot of the apps had limited adoption or only served a few users. So there were big pushes toward rationalizing the portfolio at that time. It, you know, so do I modernize? They had to make a decision, consolidate, do I sunset? And that was all based on value. So what's happening today and how are businesses making the case to modernize? Are they going through a similar rationalization exercise, Doug? Well, the, the Y2K era experience that you talked about was back in the days of, you know, th throw the requirements over the wall, and then we had waterfall development that lasted months, in, in some cases, years. Uh, we see today's most successful companies uh, building cross-functional teams, you know, uh, the C-suite, the line of business, the operations, the data and analytics teams, the IT. Everybody has a seat at the table to lead innovation and modernization in initiatives. And they don't start, the most successful companies don't start by talking about technology, they start by envisioning a business outcome, by envisioning a transformed customer experience. You hear the example of, of Amazon writing the press release for the product or service it wants to, to deliver, and then it works backwards to create it. You got to work backwards to determine the tech that will get you there. Uh, what's very clear though, is that you can't transform or modernize 
by lifting and shifting the legacy mess into the cloud. That doesn't give you the seamless processes. It doesn't give you data-driven personalization. It doesn't give you a connected and consistent customer experience, whether it's online or mobile, um, you know, bots, chat, phone, everything that we have today that requires a modern scalable cloud native uh, approach uh, and agile deliver, uh, uh, iterative experience where you're collaborating with this cross-functional team and course correcting and making sure you're on track to what's needed. Yeah, now uh, Tony, both Doug uh, and Sanjeev have been you know, talking about what I'm going to call this IT and business schism. And we've all done, done surveys. One of the things I'd love to see Couchbase do in future surveys is not only serve, survey the IT heavy, but also survey the business heavy and see what they say about who's leading the digital transformation and who's in charge of the customer experience. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Tony? Well, there's no question. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the more things change. I mean, we've been talking about that IT and the business has to get together. We talked about this back during, and Doug, you probably won't remember this, back during the Y2K ERP days is that you need these cross-functional teams. We've been seeing this. Um, I think what's happening today though, is that, you know, back in the Y2K era, we were basically going into like our bedrock systems and having to totally re-engineer them. And today what we're looking at is that, okay, those bedrock systems, the ones that basically are keeping the lights on, okay, those are there, we're not going to mess with that. But on top of that, that's where we're going to innovate. And that gives us a chance to be more, you know, more directed, um, you know, uh, and therefore we can bring these related domains together. I mean, that's why just kind of, you know, talking you know, where, where Sanjeev you brought up the term of data mesh. Um, I've been a bit of a cynic about data mesh, but I do think that where it can work is where we bring a bunch of these connected teams together, teams that have some sort of shared context. You know, it's everybody that's, every team that's working, let's say around the customer, for instance, which could be, you know, in marketing, it could be in sales, uh, order processing in in some cases, you know, in you know in 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 in, in logistics and in, in, in delivery. Um, and so I think that's where I think we you know there's some hope. And the fact is that with all the advanced you know you know basically low code no code tools, there are ways to bring some of these other players you know into the process who you know previously had to you know were sort of a you know more at the end of like a, you know, kind of a I sort of like a throw it over the wall type process. So I, so I do believe, despite all my cynicism, I do believe there's some hope. Oh, thank you. Okay, last question. Uh, and, and maybe all of you could answer this. Maybe Sanjeev, you can start it off and then okay. Doug and Tony can chime in. Uh, the survey, in the survey, about half, nearly half of the 650 respondents said they could tangibly show their organizations improve customer experiences that were realized from digital projects in the last 12 months. Now, again, not surprising, but we've been talking about digital experiences, uh, but there's a long way to go judging from our pandemic customer experiences. And we, again, you know, the, some were great, some were terrible. And so, you know, and some actually got worse, right? Will that improve? When and how will it improve? Where's 5G and things like that fit in, in terms of uh, improving customer outcomes? Maybe Sanjeev, you could start us mm -hmm. off here. And by the way, plug any research that you're working on in this sort of sure. area, please do. Thank you, Dave. Um, I, as a resident optimist on this call, I'll I'll get us started, and I'm sure Doug and Tony will will have uh, interesting counterpoints. So I'm a technology fanboy. I have to admit. I am in awe of all these uh, new companies and how they have been able to rise up and handle extreme scale. In this time that we are speaking on this show, uh, these uh, food delivery companies would have probably handled tens of thousands of orders in, in minutes, you know. So uh, these concurrent orders, delivery, uh, customer support, uh, geospatial location intelligence, uh, all of this is has really become commonplace now. It used to be that, you know, large companies like Apple would be able to handle uh, all of these supply chain issues, disruptions that we've been facing. But now, I, I've, I've, in my opinion, I think we, we are seeing this in, Doug mentioned Rocket Mortgage, so we're seeing it in FinTech, in uh, shopping apps. So we've seen the same scale 
and it's more than 5G. It, it includes things like even the, in the public cloud, we have much more efficient, better hardware, which can do like deep learning networks much more efficiently. So it's machine learning, a lot of natural language programming, being able to handle unstructured data, so in my opinion, it's quite phenomenal to see how uh, technology has actually come to rescue in, uh, uh, as you know, billions of us have gone online over the last two years. Yeah, so Doug, to, to, to Sanjeev's point, we may, he's saying basically you ain't seen nothing yet. What, what are your thoughts here? Yeah. Final well, point? yeah, I mean, there's some incredible technologies coming, including 5G, but you know, it, it's only going to pave the cow path if the underlying app, if the underlying process is clunky. You have to modernize to take advantage of you know serverless scale, scalability, autonomous optimization, advanced data science. Uh, you know, these, there's lots of cutting edge capabilities out there today, but, you know, lifting and shifting, you, you got to get your hands dirty and actually modernize. Uh, on that data front, I mentioned um, my research this year, I'm doing a lot of uh, in-depth looks at some of the analytical data platforms, you know, these lake houses, uh, we've, we've had some conversations about that. Uh, and um, helping companies to harness their data to have a more personalized and predictive and, and uh, proactive experience. So, you know, we're talking about the, the snowflakes and data bricks and Googles and Teradatas and Verticas and yellow bricks. And uh, that's that's the research I'm focusing on this year. Yeah, you know, you, your point about paving the cow path is right on, especially with a lot of the pandemic, a lot of the processes were unknown, but you saw this with RPA, paving the cow path only got you so far. And, and so, you know, great points there. Tony, you, you get the last word, bring us home. Well, put it this way. I think there's a lot of hope in terms of that the new generation of developers that are coming in are a lot more savvy about things like data. Um, and I think also the new generation of, of, of people in the business are realizing that we need to have data as a core competence. So I do have optimism there that the fact is, I think there is um, I think there's a, a much greater consciousness within both the business side and the technical, in the technology side of the organization of the importance of data and how to approach that. And so I'd like to just end on that note. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and, and I think you're right, putting data at the core is, is critical. Uh, data, data mesh, I think very well describes the problem and, and to Jamak's credit, lays out a solution. It's the technology is not there yet, uh, nor are the standards. At any rate, I want to thank the panelists here. Uh, amazing, you guys are always so much fun to work with uh, and, and love to have you back in the future. And thank you for joining today's broadcast brought to you by Couchbase. By the way, check out Couchbase on the road this summer at their application modernization summits. They're making up, up for two years of shut-in and coming to you. So you got to go to couchbase.com slash roadshow to find a city near you where you can meet face to face. In a moment, Ravi Mayaram, the chief technology officer of Couchbase will join me. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in high tech enterprise coverage. Couchbase is developer friendly. If you haven't used the relational database in the past, you will find it quite easy to get started. One of the main differences, of course, is that we store data as JSON, and there are many good reasons for that, but here are two of them. It is flexible and widely supported by languages and frameworks and has the same structure as the data in your code, and it helps you to avoid unnecessary joins, which improves performance at scale. But storing data as JSON raises another issue. How do you query it? In the past, many NoSQL databases decided to create their own query languages, and a few of them are pretty awesome. But what we realized after all this time is that developers like SQL. This is why Couchbase created NICO, an implementation of a spec called SQL++, which is not just SQL-like, it is SQL 92 compatible. You can grab the same queries running in your application right now and run them against Couchbase with no changes. For instance, here's how a select looks like. And here's how an update looks like. Don Chamberlain, the father of SQL, is a big supporter of this language as well. He even wrote a short book about it, and you can download the book with the link in the description. But what about ACID? Well, 
Couchbase also supports two types of asset transactions, Nico and Key Value. The Nico one is very similar to transactions in relational databases, where you specify start transaction, execute some operations, and then commit it at the end. Key value transactions use a special implementation with no center coordination and no single point of failure, which makes it a better fit when, yeah, you guessed it, when you need to execute transactions at scale. Modernizing applications can be a complicated situation for many folks. It's useful to have some best practices and tangible steps that can remove friction and yield some quick wins. We're now joined by Couchbase CTO Ravi Mayaram, who will cover how organizations can approach application modernization, what role the cloud plays, and what you need to know about building a business case. Ravi, welcome back to theCUBE. Good to see you again. Very good to see you. Thanks for having me, Dave. Yes, our pleasure. According to a recent Couchbase digital transformation survey that you guys ran, about 650 respondents, CIOs, CTOs, et cetera, the inertia of legacy technology held back, according to the respondents, 82% of enterprises from modernizing their portfolios in 2021. So I want to talk about the what and the why of modernization. Ravi, what does application modernization mean to you and why is it top of mind for organizations? Yeah, I think there have been multiple forces at work here for a while and they've all come to a tipping point with uh, the pandemic. And uh, uh, it's a combination of factors and uh, the legacy technologies were built for a different generation of applications. So it's a generational shift that we're undergoing. Uh, part of it is the, the consumption model, which is all cloud-based and pay-as-you-go kind of stuff. The other is edge is in the middle of a lot of these conversations together with uh, the velocity variety um, of data that you have to actually sort of consume and results that you need to produce. These were all not what the sort of the, the infrastructure of old on which the applications were built on uh, uh, stand for. So the infrastructure of the substrate requires modernization uh, in order for the businesses to transform themselves. That's what's going on. We call it digital transformation from a technology perspective, but it's businesses that are transforming uh, the business models uh, in front of our eyes. Uh, you know, we have seen the media go from uh, set-top boxes to streaming everywhere. Um, like that, every business e-commerce has changed uh, the way we sort of uh, do any business. And gaming has changed uh, the the banking industry, the healthcare, everything is changing uh, in terms of the fundamental movement, if you if you could uh, sort of say that, is to reach the consumer directly and sort of disintermediate the intermediaries. And in that process, the technologies that we had used to build the, the you know, last previous generation of applications no longer scale, no longer are nimble enough, uh, no longer cater to the modern uh, the needs of the modern data and the infrastructure on which uh, we are standing up these uh, applications. So that's what's driving the modernization effort. And uh, in, in that, uh, you know, we have always started to say that a few years ago that data is the new oil. Um, so that plays a very critical role in how the data silos and infrastructure that enterprises have is what's holding them back. And uh, this whole effort is uh, in, in terms of modernizing that infrastructure uh, through the modern means of uh, uh, the cloud computing, uh, the modern serverless architectures and microservices and uh, the edge and the AI play, play an important role in this. So we're going to hear later from Amdocs uh, about their mm -hmm. modernization and where Couchbase helps and fits, but I'd love to hear your perspective as to how Couchbase helps organizations modernize. Right, I think one of the uh, uh, fundamental things that has happened is that in the last 30, 40 odd years, the data infrastructure has sort of become uh, a, a sprawl. Uh, we had built uh, multiple systems, uh, uh, relational databases, caches, uh, search systems, analytical systems, uh, all uh, requiring for us to move the data uh, from one system to the other in order for you to get the value from those. And this is basically what we call as a data sprawl or database sprawl. 
And this leads to so many sort of uh, downstream effects all the way from uh, data not being available uh, at the time when the engagement, uh, the, when the customer is engaged to data governance, security and all those issues because the threat surface area is wide. And now you're putting all this infrastructure on the modern uh, sort of cloud computing paradigm and the, and the costs are sort of ballooning and uh, because those older infrastructures that were built, uh, when you deploy them on the cloud, uh, it it creates, it adds to the, uh, the complexity of the sprawl and on top of that, the cost of this. So uh, a system like Couchbase is what um, uh, simplifies the sprawl for uh, our customers. And it is built for the modern uh, sort of requirements of scale and performance, low latency and the flexibility uh, of being able to sort of not have to go through this whole sort of cycle of whenever you have to have a, a change in your application that touches your data, uh, that it, it actually creates a huge tumult and those upgrades and all those life cycle having to ca carry pagers. Uh, I mean, that doesn't work anymore in these days of, you know, five, nine up times and 24-7, uh, uh, 365 availability of uh, your services. Uh, so in that area is where Couchbase sort of helps uh, our customers to modernize uh, their sort of data infrastructure. It uh, fuses um, the multiple technologies that were spread across uh, into one platform. So it gives a, a simpler programming paradigm. Uh, there is one way to scale, manage, administer, uh, patch, upgrade, all that mechanism is sort of not just thought through and automated, but it also sort of centralized. This uh, whole thing simplifies at the end of the day, uh, the total task of managing, uh, because the, the volume of data that you have to manage now is, you know, uh, orders of magnitude, three to four orders of magnitude more than uh, what it was just a few years ago. And uh, so in that, uh, containing the sprawl, uh, uh, agility of development uh, are, are sort of, and the simplicity of deployment and management are some of the key capabilities that uh, enterprises look to us to solve. And in that, bringing in all the way from cloud to multi-cloud to edge uh, is how this sort of strategy evolves for enterprises. So square this circle for me, because in the panel we just had, there's a lot of agreement with what you just said, lift and shift, of legacy platforms doesn't work. Uh, we're, it, we're, it might work for the cloud vendor to get the data in the cloud, but it generally doesn't work for the customer. And you mentioned right. sprawl. We talked about this in the panel about you know, data yeah. by its very nature is distributed. We talked about data mesh. There's a lot of skepticism around data mesh, but that, that's cool. And you mentioned edge. So yes. I'm interested in the cloud's role here. Is the idea that you're actually putting all this stuff in one place, how does that fit with the edge? Maybe you could help us understand what you're thinking of that and where the cloud fits. Yes, um, you know, it's about uh, centralizing a data up to a point and decentralizing. It's in the magic of how you actually enable that. Um, uh, for example, just your traffic signal, your car, uh, or if you're on a cruise ship, each one is an edge they all generate petabytes of data and then you basically, uh, you, you can consume that. But if you're going to stream all this data to a centralized place like a cloud, that's, uh, you know, most of the data actually is not something that you're going to store forever. The, those are, you know, topical and that information is required at the edge. You should synthesize that information and take the noise from it and discard the signal. So that's where the edge, uh, typically the edge is not some, you know, personal device alone or, uh, uh, or a IOT sensor sending data. That is also a, a sort of a one, one element of the edge, but the edge is about decentralizing the cloud, so to say. So you can have multi, your topologies of not having all your data sit in the cloud, centralized someplace behind five firewalls. So when your application tries to reach that, all the latency comes into play. So that's what you want to uh, decentralize and have the data available as close to the engagement of the data with the consumer of it. So in that is the decentralization strategy where you can have multiple topologies, a tree, a mesh, uh, however you choose to, so that you get to get the data closest. Um, it could be a mobile device. Uh, it could be a, 
a, a smaller deployment of a server. It could be uh, uh, a personal electronic device like a watch, or it could be all the way in an IoT gateway. These are the various sort of decentralization of the data that has to happen. So it's about moving the data fastest. It's almost like CDNing of the data is what, uh, sorry, uh, for those, it's um, content delivery networks is <laughs> what CDN stands for, where we used to actually move static content in the good old days. That's what made, made our web pages faster. Now we can actually move live data that much faster by using replication technology. So when you move the data towards, towards the edge, what you're trying to do is bring that data closer uh, to the compute where it's actually happening, as opposed to keeping the data centralized someplace back in the cloud and server, and all your application logic is actually sitting on the device or on the edge. So you're constantly uh, shoveling the data from the cloud to the edge, from edge to the cloud at the time of compute, as opposed to having it available at the time of uh, um, the consumption of the data. That's where the paradigm uh, shift is actually happening. And uh, this basically is not about better user experience. It's also about backend networking and other costs that you can actually uh, gain from by not having to sort of repeatedly sort of shovel data back and forth. So that's the strategy that uh, enterprises are adopting now. This has become, so to say, core part of the architecture of modernization uh, uh, in terms of where everybody can see this has to move to. And uh, our edge and mobile product um, also plays a role. And uh, that's one of the other elements, uh, aspects of it that customers to look us, uh, look to us for. So it's a balance and Couchbase can play in both places. The, a lot of the data, if I heard you correctly at the edge is ephemeral, but if I want to do you know, AI inferencing in real time, I got to do it at the edge. I can't send it back to the cloud and, and, right. and, and do the modeling you know, post-process. That's not going to work. All right, let's talk about the business case. You know, we've, we've, yeah. we've hit on the what and the why, but you know, how does it get paid for? Companies sometimes struggle to plan for and budget appropriately for their outcomes. What yes. do customers need to know about, you know, how do they get this past the CFO's office for and the other business decision makers? I think there is an opportunity cost uh, with the sort of lack of modernization. Uh, if uh, people are doing their classic sort of so to say IT style budgeting, uh, then it will just look like we have to modernize uh, you know, some older infrastructure. It's not about that, it's about modernizing or making your business relevant uh, to, uh, to the consumers because the way consumers uh, go about consuming your services now is very different from the way you had originally imagined and built for. And in that lies the, the, the transformation, uh, not to see this as a IT, uh, just as an IT infrastructure modernization, but more from the standpoint of business transformation and uh, the tooling that is required for this business transformation to be successful. So it requires the involvement of um, not leaving it to just, you know, uh, uh, IT, oriented sort of uh, uh, thinking of modernizing, but from the standpoint of looking at the, the the business and what are the transformations that they need to, if they don't keep up with the Joneses, they, in this digital divide, they may find themselves on the sort of either the wrong side or in the chasm. So I think that mindset uh, that I was uh, sort of, in addition to sort of uh, IT pushing for this, uh, it's got to have a C-suite uh, sponsorship understanding and uh, sort of championing of this, then those initiatives will succeed because uh, it's not just a technology transformation, it is accompanied by business and sort of, so to say, cultural transformation inside the enterprise. Yeah, and it's interesting in the survey, it was very much IT you know, survey, I get that. Mm -hmm. and, and the IT pros, the CIOs, et cetera, felt that, 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 that the IT organization was largely responsible for the digital strategy. And I think that was largely a function of, we just came out of the, the pandemic or hopefully coming right. out of the pandemic. And so they had all these tactical needs, but now you're saying step back, align with the business, make sure the C-suite's involved, and that's going right. to reduce the friction of, of getting this stuff paid for. Correct. And you know, the, uh, this observation was also there, if you, uh, you must have noticed that, you know, many uh, of these sort of transformative strategies, if you just leave it to like an IT thing, they end up being reactive. 
Uh, but the proactive strategies are the one that actually uh, succeed because they understand that this is a sort of enterprise transformation. It could be disruptive. Uh, it is what is required for the enterprise to get to the uh, to the next level uh, or to be uh, in this to be relevant in this sort of modern economy, if you would. So I think that is what uh, what people are reacting to is the fact that this pandemic has pushed people to modernize quickly, and that may have happened as a reaction to the reality of the situation. But more and more, uh, uh, even among these strategies and more and more initiatives that people are taking, they may have sort of a longer term sort of thinking in this. Uh, that requires the, uh, definitely, without RT, it's not going to succeed. And they are going to be in the middle, and they will be uh, in the forefront of many technology decisions that they have to make. But having a, a C-suite level sponsorship in addition to that, with the impetus of what is the business transformation this is actually going to achieve, um, those you will see will succeed a lot more because otherwise you, we see that, you know, good good number of about 80% of these projects fail or, or, or they suffer delays or scale back or never get started uh, because, you know, uh, uh, the understanding of what is the business value of it is perhaps not not clearly articulated. Instead, it just becomes a a technology modernization conversation without the accompanying benefit. Yeah, got it. Okay, uh, you guys recently announced some updates to your platform. Can you run us through the the highlights? You know what the customers get and and how it relates to this conversation, modernizing application strategies. Yes. So. Uh, uh, we, we will be uh, releasing our uh, Couchbase server 7.1. And uh, that is what will be the sort of underneath platform for our the Couchbase uh, Capella, which is the our DBAS. Both uh, have exciting innovations um, that we would be putting out. Uh, let me just run through a few things uh, on the uh, uh, Couchbase server 7.1 because there are some uh, amazing uh, capabilities we have introduced there. We are really excited about the opportunities this brings Couchbase into play. Uh, first is we have a, a, a brand new storage engine that we put in there, which uh, significant, significantly uh, reduces the, uh, the cost of running Couchbase. Uh, with this capability, we can actually consume a lot less memory. And that's, that is like a 10x improvement on this one. So from that standpoint, we are 10x more efficient in terms of resource consumption, the expensive memory oriented resource consumption. This now allows Couchbase to sort of not just cater to those high performance, um, you know, hyperscale scenarios that we are known for, but also the more the classic disk oriented uh, applications, which are not that performance sensitive, but they're more cost sensitive. So that's a huge uh, step forward for Couchbase because there are a lot more now opportunities where sort of we become uh, that much more uh, cost efficient for enterprises to run. And this is something that uh, many enterprises have asked for. And we know uh, many more use cases where we would be more relevant with that uh, innovation. In This has been a, a sort of a long journey. Building storage engines is, uh, you know, uh, is a very difficult endeavor and, we took that on knowing that uh, what we can achieve here would be a game changer uh, for Couchbase and in terms of how uh, uh, the consolidation of multiple things that you can do in our platform just got this sort of boost of being able to do a lot more with a lot less resources. In addition to that, we have done uh, enhancements to our analytics service uh, with uh, the work that we have done there. Uh, it, it can sort of do a lot more um, uh, availability uh, of the of, of the analytic service, uh, which uh, strengthens the analytics side of the product, which now allows you to run analysis uh, on JSON uh, straight up without requiring the operational side of the uh, the database. So you can just simply do uh, straight off analytic stuff because it it, it can now uh, give you the higher availability and disaster recovery that you would want if you're going to depend on these uh, systems. With that, we are done with some uh, real good work with a Tableau integration, which makes it easy to visualize this. Um, uh, uh, and uh, one other important capability we introduce here is the um, on in the entire platform is what we call as user-defined functions. This now allows us to 
write custom logic in JavaScript in the server, Couchbase server. This is this helps you write procedural logic in the middle of uh, SQL queries, which is a humongous capability that you know and the classical systems process now with that we have closed the gap. If you know how to program to sort of classical relational systems, pretty much you have one to one equivalence of that uh, in Couchbase. So if you come from the good relational world, uh, it will be very easy a breeze for you to understand how to program in this modern NoSQL system, which both supports um, uh, SQL as well as the classic uh, asset transaction capabilities. And last, uh, we expanded the support to ARM processors. Uh, and typically, uh, ARM processors at least save you a quarter of uh, your budget because of it being that much more uh, cost efficient in terms of uh, its operational and power capabilities. So with that, net-net uh, Couchbase server becomes a lot more um, uh, cost efficient. And at the same time, it also, in one small swoop, becomes that database server which can both handle your in-memory uh, capabilities, that, that speed and hyperscale, as well as uh, the classical use cases of being uh, disk, uh, disk-oriented uh, classical relational database uh, use cases. Nice. So that, that, that rounds out our offering. It's been a long journey for us to get here from being the high-performance uh, low latency system to uh, the classical database use cases. As yeah, well. I mean that's great. You got you got memory optimization. You mentioned the 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 ARM base. Now you're on that curve, which is great. Software companies love when you get cheaper, faster hardware. Uh, right. You're making it easy to speak the language of you know traditional stuff. So that's awesome. Um, you and I, you mentioned uh, Capella. You and I talked about uh, yes. at Couchbase Connects, C Capella. You've been moving hard with your DBAS strategy. How's it going? And then beyond these announcements, what's, what should we look for from Couchbase? You know, uh, our fundamental uh, mission is to make the developer experience uh, that much more easier, that much, uh, remove the, all the frictions that, uh, that has existed for developers to adopt Couchbase. And uh, the Capella strategy is to Leverage the cloud so you have number one the ease of development. Just bring your browser, start to learn, develop even simple sample applications, and deploy them. From there, you can scale, and you can have production level deployments. That whole journey of a developer, along with the ability to sort of have your, a, you know, metered billing and pay as you go uh, uh, pricing, uh, so that it becomes easier for developers to sort of consume this and uh, show the value of what they can build here. That is our um, sort of journey of bringing it closer uh, to our developers and make it simpler for them to sort of uh, get started and build the, the mission critical applications that they have uh, trusted to build on Couchbase to become that much more simpler, faster and easier for them. So that's the journey. So that's the kind of announcements you will see coming out in Capella. And for that, this this seven one server is is the platform on which we we are sort of adding those capabilities to make a Capella that much easier for developers to adopt. Outstanding! You've been busy, and it looks like you got a lot ahead yes. of you. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, Ravi. Up next, we bring on the customer perspective with Amdocs. They've got a real world example of a modernization journey that they go through. They had to modernize legacy Oracle Web Logic infrastructure with a microservices architecture, and of course, Couchbase. Keep it right there. You're watching theCUBE. Well, we're a, a unique sort of a database system because um, we help customers you know, create modern applications. And if you really look at both the drivers for needing to mod modernize your applications, we, our customers find situations where uh, they need to deliver these great kind of uh, user experiences, but they lack the flexibility to do so. And they can't adapt their application very effectively um, and, or in, in a timely manner because their older applications are built on relational technology. Uh, and you know, that's very, very structured and oftentimes very difficult to change. Uh, but we've certainly found that they, they need this new kind of uh, adaptability and flexibility um, 
to enhance their user experiences, to you know, help match um, personalized preferences to, let's say, big dynamic catalogs of, of products or services. Uh, and the main underpinning of this that Couchbase assists with is we offer uh, the JSON document format as our, uh, as our foundation, which is very easy to change and modify and add structure to the, uh, to the data itself while the application is running, the, you know, running, uh, running itself. So there's no uh, you know, deployment lag or permission you have to ask for uh, to a DBA. So that's one of the core reasons. This, the next one a requirement that we're seeing is um, really on the developer side. So the implementers have a couple of challenges that they're facing. And, and one is, you know, can I keep using my existing skill set, even though I need, you know, that flexibility or I need performance at, you know, at scale as, a, as another requirement. But, you know, I know SQL. But don't force me to learn something brand new in order to uh, take advantage of these newer capabilities. You know, give me all the things that I expect out of a database be, that are born from my experience with relational technologies. Um, so Couchbase so, you know, supports that with uh, uh, our support for uh, uh, SQL++ as our core query language and the fact that we've got lots of those capabilities built into the database itself. Amdocs is a leader in providing software and services to some key industries like telecommunications, media, and financial services. In our next session, we welcome Cedric Jegu, who's the head of technical product at Amdocs, and we'll learn about Amdocs modernization journey and how it added value for their end customers. Cedric, welcome. Welcome, how are you? Good, thank you. So describe your modern application, your portfolio, and you know, what you're delivering for, for customers. So Hamdocs is a BSS OSS player. So we are providing a, a full digital suite for customers. Um, our customers are communication service providers, which are, have to deploy a full digital suite to customer experience. Um, where uh, for the full OS BSS OSS stacks, so uh, actually MDocs is uh, one of the leader in this uh, kind of digital transformation. Yeah, so of course you talk about OSS and, and, and BSS. I mean, you're talking about some really hardened uh, stacks, right? Uh, <laughs> the telco industry. Uh, say what you want about it, but boy, the phone works <laughs> when you dial it. So, so you got sort of a decades old you know, platform that you guys have been evolving over the, over the years. Describe this modernization journey and, and the role that, that Couchbase played. You know, what value does this offer, this modernization offer to your organization and where does Couchbase fit? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's the same for that. So basically, what uh, is a w w our solution is, you know, it's a portfolio of uh, a large number of components which have to deal with uh, from the as a, the experience of the user and from uh, and then uh, dealing all the uh, the activation of the services in the network in order to deliver a solution a, a pure service like mobile services or communication services to uh, to the end users so um we have a full suite which uh, uh, was previously based on you know on te technologies based on oracle with web logic and, uh, and things like that and what we did is that we do a modernization of uh, of this something like six years ago a bit more than six years ago we start the modernization and the uh, uh, transformation of our product into a cloud native solution cloud native solution so uh, and when we did that we start with coachbase as a partner uh, to provide the the, the cloud native uh, database so uh, we are actually delivering, we have an R&D of more than 8,000 people developing this product. It's a product which is used by more than 300 customers. Uh, so so it's, it's really a product that needs to be very flexible and needs to address many kind of use cases from our, our telco, our customers, which are CSPs, usually tier zero, tier one telco. So we, what we wanted to build is a full cloud native solution that can work on any cloud then can um, uh, can scale very uh, uh, very easily, 
and uh, can address multiple use cases. Okay, and that's why Coachbase, when we selected Coachbase, it it matched a lot of requirements and criteria we had. And uh, when we decided to uh, to modernize our product, we decided to work with Coachbase. Yeah, so you had a lot of experience in, in legacy with Oracle and WebLogic. I'm, I'm curious, just of a follow-up, why didn't you stay with Oracle? You mentioned, got to run on any cloud, you got to be flexible, but could you, could you double click on what Couchbase delivered from a requirement standpoint that was such a good fit? Well, the, the, the good fit with the technology such as uh, uh, Coachbase is first, it's a NoSQL database, right? So it's in terms of performance for some of the use cases that we have. It's very important to have, uh, you know, technology which are hardened and optimized for the NoSQL use cases. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as I mentioned, the scalability. The fact that you can uh, almost uh, infinitely, you can increase the size of your cluster uh, you can add more uh, 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 servers, and, um, and 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 this will scale, uh, you know, uh, very rapidly. And also, what we are very interesting to have from uh, Coachbase is the ability to have something which can be uh, replicated across multiple sites. So uh, with the XDCR technology from Coachbase, which enable to build, you know, very uh, modern architecture with a deployment on multiple regions to have a disaster recovery, uh, active, active sites, you know, things like that, which are very becoming like uh, the main requirement for more customers now. Okay, so I'm presuming there were, there were parts of your application portfolio that you, 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 you weren't going to touch and throw away, but you had to collect or connect the, the new with the old. That's always, you know, you know, a challenge. I'm wondering what advice you'd give to an organization that's kind of investing in a similar path, trying to deliver the best digital experiences to, to customers. You know, what, what would you say are the modernization you got to have, must haves, whether it's architecture, you know, internal culture, what, what are some of those items? So, so Dave, yes, you're right. I think the integration with the legacy systems is actually, you know, a very, very important uh, topic uh, in, in our domain, in the telco domain. But we, we made a very, uh, I would say, drastic choice or brave choice choice when uh, in uh, six years from now, when we decided to reformat, to replatform, sorry, completely our, our portfolio. Okay, so we, we changed more than 95% of our portfolio. And 95% of our portfolio today are cloud native, which means that they can be deployed on any cloud, that actually they are, are, are fully scalable. And... Um, and, and still, we did this transformation. Now, when we do the digital transformation of the of our telco uh, of the our customer system, then we need to integrate with uh, legacy systems, and we need to help our customers to migrate from their legacy systems to cloud native uh, solutions. And uh, doing so, it's it, it's important to have in the database domain. It's very important to have a solution which is very flexible in terms of uh, uh, what kind of data you can manage. And uh, I can, um, uh, as I said, scale easily for sure, but also it's secure, okay? Because when you are moving the data from a legacy system, uh, Oracle base or whatever, to uh, another type of, uh, of database, you want to be sure that you, are, you can do it securely and you, you are not uh, compromising in any sense uh, in terms of security, scalability, uh, uh, et cetera, right? So, so um, in, in this case, I mean, I will say in, 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 in this approach, in this journey, uh, Coachbase was very, very, uh, a very, very important uh, component in our, 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 in, our, in our strategy for all the reasons I mentioned, right? It's very cloud native, it's scalable, it's secure. Uh, it's an add-on product, uh, telco grade. So, uh, so that's, that's why it really is uh, the, the, the key aspect here. You know, this notion that 90, you really replatformed 90% of your portfolio and made a cloud native, that's, that's a, is a brave move because a lot of companies do that, I, that I've talked to, they'll build an abstraction layer in microservices, make that piece cloud native, and then have that kind of overlay. Uh, uh, you decided not to do that. Is, why is that, was that for, performance reasons, you were worried about you just bringing along technical debt. I mean, that really must have been an interesting discussion internally in your company. 
Yeah, Dave, it's, it's true. I mean, the main motivation, the main driver was business flexibility. Because now we, are, we live in a world where our customers, what they need is to be able to test a new feature quickly. They need to be able to, 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 to scale their system in a matter of uh, hours, okay? Uh, so we are not in a, in a domain anymore where you, you, when you have to upgrade something, it needs to take a few days. It needs to be done in a, a, a very, very quickly. And the, the only way to achieve those uh, requirements, these business requirements, is to be cloud native. It's to build microservices and to really rely 100% of uh, microservices architectures. Because this is the only way you will have the business flexibility. You will be able to have a resilient architecture. Uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, you, you can deploy this with a full high availability across multiple zones, multiple regions, and things like that. So uh, any modern architecture today that, that is competing with us are actually a, ba a microservices-based architecture. There is no other way to achieve the, to, to, to meet the requirement of the market today, and especially when 5G is coming. Things will become much more complex, will become much more uh, uh, distributed. Uh, you, you cannot work anymore with a monolith architecture. And again, having the database is, is no way different. It needs to follow the same kind of architecture, it needs to follow the same principles. So that's, that, that, that's why, um, I mean, uh, Another, another, another point about uh, about right? Yeah. So if I if I had to summarize, it sounds like your top three requirements would be flexibility, which you're getting from the cloud native and microservices piece, the scale and the security. Is that right? Did I get that right? The three top requirements. That's correct. That's right. And the resiliency as well. I mean, the fact that now you know with microservices architecture, if one of the system is down, he knows how to self to to restart it himself, right? Itself. Sorry. So so that's. This kind of architecture that we built, it's an architecture which can be resilient in a sense that it can sense itself and it can ensure uh, full availability. And if something is going down or is, is, is not working properly, then all uh, so, sort kind of mechanisms will happen in order to, to go back to a, a stable state. Yeah, so you've got that automation in there, so you don't doesn't require the labor that it might have you know, 10 years ago. So you're, you're obviously embracing cloud native, microservices, so you're on that journey. I'm curious, what are you doing with that? You, you're, free, you're freeing up, you know, guys used to you know, bring in lab coats and dig in and figure out what's wrong or restart the system. Where are you in your journey and how are you sort of reallocating those resources and, and where do you see that going? Yeah, okay, so, so that's, that's a very good point because actually we, when we build this new system, which is enabled to, to, you know, to self heal, heal himself, right? Uh, actually, the question was more about how we can improve the system even more. How we can be sure that uh, uh, you know issues that we, we any issues which we, we are facing will not happen again, will not occur again. Okay, and this is a SRE uh, pr principle, okay, practice that we have now. People are working on automation. They are building uh, automation around all these uh, recovery procedures, or uh, about. Uh, uh, fixing, so they are not actually digging into the, the, the application now anymore, into the system. They learn how the system is, is working and building the, all the right automation tasks to ensure that the system is constantly uh, resilient. Right? So that's the SRE practices. Our organization is now built around, uh, you know, this kind of, this, this approach, DevOps, pure, pure DevOps. Uh, being fully agile, obviously, having a SRE organization or SRE-oriented organization, and uh, and that's the only way uh, you know you can reach very high uh, high uh, SLA in terms of av availability. So the big problem that your traditional telco customers have is the the amount of data that they're, they're servicing going through the roof, and the cost per bit is sinking like that. And you have all the over-the-top providers coming in creating these customer experiences with modern applications and they've owned the customer data. You mentioned 5G, so I'm interested what the future of modern apps looks like for Amdocs and your customers because 5G gives your traditional telco customers the ability, if, you, if, if they can have these flexible systems that you're providing, to now have better relationships with customers and actually kind of reclaim you know, some of that, uh, that value that they've lost to a lot of competitors. Your thoughts on the future? 
So first, you know, technically speaking, we, we, we will have two challenges. One is about data, another one is about distribution of the workload, okay? Because when we are speaking about 5G, we are speaking about the age, we are speaking about the fact that an application may be allocated very closely to the network because it needs to be to to to, to achieve uh, you know to, to deliver very uh, short latency and uh, oh, and and this application can move okay so you 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 will have to be able to distribute completely your your solutions okay and that's why we are working closely with uh, the the cloud providers AWS Azure Google and uh, because we we, we need to be sure that the applications or the systems that we are building will be able to distribute the application as close as possible to the end user. Okay, so that's that's one of the key challenges, which means that the application needs to be very portable, needs to be very scalable, and then it needs to be able to move very quickly from one place to another. That's really what is what will what is happening now and what will become the norm with five G. The other challenge is uh, uh, behind the communication of all these components is the really the data because now we will uh, capture more and more data coming from the different systems. And I'm not speaking only about the the, cons cons uh, the customer data, uh, who they are, wh what they are, what they, 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 they like, and what they want to do, etc. I'm speaking also about uh, the, the monitoring data of the systems. Okay, so we will generate a lot of information, and this those, this information needs to be uh, treated very quickly, it needs to be stored in very large data lake, and we will need to have extraction and manipulation of the data very very quickly to to to, to give the right information to the applications. Um, in this case, okay, it's very important to have application to have databases that can, as I said, scale uh, very quickly. But also, we'll be able to have very uh, high density node, you know, sense that they, it, it, with a certain amount of memory or certain amount of storage, you can store a lot of data. And this is where uh, we are always, you know, checking what is the best technologies. And so far, you know, Coachbase is a technology that we are using for, for stocking, uh, storing all the, those data. Um, uh, because because it's, it's the, the, the ratio in terms of uh, performance and the number of data you can store uh, is very high. Okay, so that's that's uh, another challenge that we are addressing. Of course, Coachbase is, is, is not the only solution, but it's another, another one. Excellent, okay, we, we're going to leave it there, Cedric. Thanks so much, a great story and really appreciate your insights. You're welcome, Dave. Hi, if you are getting started with the Coachbase SDK, you are in the right place. Today, I would like to talk about a few things that will help you to extract the most out of the database and also make your experience smoother. When you install Couchbase, the web console is also installed by default and you can access it at the port 891 in your browser. However, the SDK does not use this port to connect to Couchbase. In fact, it might use a number of ports depending on the protocol and services that you are running. The SDK also needs to access all nodes of the cluster. If for some reason you cannot connect successfully, double check if you have the right credentials and try using the Couchbase SDK doctor to check which ports are open in your server. The SDK automatically manages the connection internally, so you don't need to do any type of connection pooling or change the defaults unless you have some corner use case. Just use the same reference throughout your application and you are good. There are also some timeouts for key value operations and Nico. Both of them are aggressive because we expect that the network latency between your application and the database to be minimal. Another reason why we have those timeouts is that at scale, it is preferable to fail fast than leave an application thread waiting for a result from the database for too long, as over time, those blocking threads might accumulate and consume all your application threads and consequently slowing down your throughput. Okay, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed the Application Modernization Summit made possible by Couchbase. We shared some fresh survey data and got the perspectives of three expert analysts. We got an outstanding roadmap from Ravi. 
Meyeram, who is the CTO of Couchbase, and of course, we got the customer angle from Cedric. So look, maybe you're an organization going through a modernization initiative, and if you're thinking about what the future of applications looks like, check out Couchbase on the Road this summer, the Application Modernization Summit, it's hitting the road, traversing North America and Europe. Find out where they'll be, where they'll be near you by visiting couchbase.com slash roadshow. Ravi is going to be there along with other thought leaders and peers who will be sharing learnings and best practices on how to modernize now and for the future. And you'll get a chance to interact with some of those peers, something that everyone I know is looking forward to. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for joining us today and thanks for watching theCUBE.